Welcome everybody at home. So just so that you know, we just handed out our semester reviews. So don't forget to pick one up when you come back. We're gonna start out with a little uh, Australian culture and a little bit of geography. So do the best you can on this little quiz and let's see who our winner is today. All right, so write your answers on your half sheet of paper. Number one, what is a billabong? We see it on all kinds of t-shirts. Is it A, an Aboriginal burial ground, which is the Indian tribe there? Is it a river? C, a skateboard park? Or D, a pool of water? Number two, if I'm going out flat like a lizard drinking, what am I doing? A, asking someone out when they are not interested. B, attempting to feed someone who only wants a drink. C, working hard. Or D, drinking too much at the pubs. Number three, what is a servo? A, a nuclear power station. B, a Sheila or girl who helps around the house. C, a gas station. D, a little gizmo in robots. I don't know. 16 to 20, somewhere around there. Number four, don't pull the raw prawn with me, mate. What does this mean? A, don't put more fuel on the barbecue. B, stop staring at me. C, don't steal my fishing bait. Or D, you can't fool me, pal. Number five, if I was to chuck a Yui in my ute, what am I doing? A, stealing a female sheep. B, selecting a Christmas tree. C, turning my truck around. Or D, throwing a boomerang. Number six, what are crow eaters, sand gropers, and banana benders? A, native spiders of Australia. B, nicknames, C, species of sharks, or D, fruit pickers. Number seven, the rollos have lobbed up. What has happened? A, you've just won a point in a game of tennis. B, your cooking has attracted a cloud of insects. C, you've just moved to houses. Or D, your family has just arrived. Number eight, what is a thunder box? A, a telephone booth. B, an outside toilet. C, a meat locker. Or D, a toy box. Number nine, what would you most likely find an Aussie doing with an idiot box? A, playing with it. B, watching it. C, taking it to bed. Or D, cooking with it. Number 10, most Australians live A, on the coast, B, inland, C, only in the west, D, only in big cities. Let's see if you remember this from your childhood. What Australian band does Dorothy the Dinosaur hang out with? Is it A, Teletubbies? B, the Bops, C, the Wiggles, or D, Big Time Rush? <laughs> Number 12, the largest sand island in the world is found off the eastern coast of Queensland. What is its name? A, Hamilton Island, B, Kangaroo Island, C, Dunk Island, or D, Fraser Island? Number 13, which of these is the Australian flag? A, B, or C? Number 14, which city of Australia was first colonized by the British 
as a penal colony, a place to put prisoners. I'll help you so you can see where they are. Number one is Melbourne, which is down here. Number two is Perth, which is over here. Uh, Sydney, C, is right over here. And then Hobart is down here in Tasmania. Yes, Nemo did go to Sydney and find Nemo. <laughs> You're just putting all that together. Isn't that cool? Yeah. In fact, it was kind of funny. I went there, and I didn't remember that until I saw it again years, like a year later. And I was like, oh, he's going to Sydney. See, I had the same reaction. Number 15, speaking of, in Australia, what is Skippy? A, a children's game. B, a TV hero. C, a kind of peanut butter. D, a lively game show. Number 16, if you found a red back on your toilet seat, what would you do? A, read it. B, throw it on the barbie, barbecue. C, pet it. Or D, make a quick retreat. That was on the toilet, yeah, good point. Number 17, by what affectionate nickname is the Sydney Harbor Bridge known as? A, the gray lady, B, the arch, C, the coat hanger, or D, old Ironside? All right, uh, hand your sheet one back. So back person, bring yours to the front. Let's see who our winner is. All right, number one, what is a billabong? Do you guys know? I wish it were that, but it is a pool of water. It's letter D, which is interesting. I don't know why that connected with skateboarding, but yeah. Number two, if I am going flat out like a lizard drinking, I am A, asking somebody out that turns you down. Interesting. Number three, what is a servo? It is C. A gas station. You'll find that a lot of the words in Aussie culture are shortened words. So instead of saying service station, they say servo. You use that as a general rule, a lot of them you'll get right. Okay. Uh, number four, don't pull the raw prawn with me, mate. What does this mean? It means D. You can't fool me, pal. Number five, if I was to check a Yui in my ute, what do you think I'm doing? Boomerang? Boomerang? C. Truck? C, we think it's C? You're right. Yep, a ute is a truck, a pickup truck in their culture. So checking a Yui in my ute. Mm -hmm. But I like the boomerang idea. Number six, what are crow eaters, sand gropers, and banana vendors? What's your guess? Native spiders? You think it's native spiders? What do you think? Fruit pickers, you think it's either A or D? The answer is B. Nicknames, you know how we make fun of people in states around us like Iowa's Iowegians? Well, the different regions of Australia, they have nicknames for each other, so they make fun of each other just like we do. Yeah, so it's B, nicknames, yeah. I believe they're the ones that are in mostly the rainforest, whereas like the sand gropers would be people on the coast, I'm assuming. Number seven, the rellos have lobbed up. What do you think? Think of shortened. Relative. Relative. So it's D, your family's just arrived. Good. Number eight, what is a thunder box? Oh. It's a toilet, an outside toilet, letter B. And obviously it gets its name because there are sounds that come out of that box, <laughs> right? It's kind of a funny name, yeah. <laughs> Number nine, what would you most likely find an Aussie doing with an idiot box? What is it? TV. It is a TV. You're right. So you are letter B, watching it. Good. Number 10, most Australians live where? On the coast, letter A. Why is that? Okay, and what's in the middle? The outback. It's all desert, right? Yep, so they pretty much live all on the coast. The only people that really live in the middle are Aborigine people. 
They're the only ones that can survive it, basically. So that was number 10 would be A on the coast. Okay. Number 11, what Australian band does Dar Dar I can't talk. Dorothy the Dinosaur hang out with? C. It is C, the Wiggles, yes. My son was into the Wiggles, it drove me crazy. Really? The Wiggles on Good Charlie? Yeah. Is it? I know it's fruit salad. I know that song. Yeah. <laughs> she can sing it for us. Look at that. Number 12, the largest sand island in the world is named D, Fraser Island. And it is gorgeous. This is like the vacation spot for Australians. This is where they go. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's really pretty. Number 13, which one is the Australian flag? A. It is letter A. How do we know? Good, because it is still a British territory, so it has to have something about the Union Jack on their flag. So this represents that they're part of British territory. This big star here, this represents the different sections of Australia that came together to become a country. And then these stars are actually a star constellation called the Southern Cross that can only be seen in the Southern Hemisphere. So that's where they get all their parts of their flag. Nope. Um, I'd have to look it up to show you. Yeah. yeah, I think the star's a little bit different, if I remember correctly. I'd have to look it up, though, yeah. Number 14, which city was colonized by prisoners? C, Sydney. Yeah, and that's why, like, like when Kiwis make fun of Australia, they call them convicts because their ancestors were convicts. So. Yeah. Wait, wait, Nemo was a prisoner. In the <laughs> you just heard this. Nemo was a prisoner in the fish tank in Sydney. There you have it. Yep, I love it. <laughs> uh, number 15 in Australia. What is Skippy? It is B, a TV hero. Now, I know you guys are too young to remember this show, but have you heard of Lassie? The dog that always saves the day. Yeah, well, in their culture, it's about the same time period they had a TV show where a kangaroo was the pet of the boy. And, of course, the boy is stuck in the well. And I watched it. It's so funny. You'll see the kangaroo hops to go get help, and he wiggles his tail and says, come with me. And then they follow him over to the well, and they save the boy. It is just a hoot, but everybody knows who Skippy is. It's great. Yeah. He brought his kangaroo with him as a pet? Three pet oh my gosh, really? They are really sweet. They're very nice animals. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. All right, number 16. If you find a red back on the toilet seat, what should you do? You should run, letter D, because it is a very poisonous spider, yes. And number 17. What nickname do Aussies use for the Sydney Harbor Bridge? They think it's kind of ugly, so they call it C, the coat hanger. Which is funny, because we think it's pretty cool, and it's right by the opera house, and so we think it looks really neat, but it does kind of look like a coat hanger, now you say, yep. So I hand it back, put how many they got right, and hand it back. All right, so in order to say hello in our Australian culture, it's it's the stereotypical thing we see in movies. It is actually, good eye, mate. You want to try it? Ready? Good eye, mate. Good eye, mate. See, you got the accent and everything. Now, before we get into filling in our, our notes, I'm going to hand some things around so you have some time to look through them. Plus, it also shows you some of the culture. The other one? It's look around. No, it's great. There you go. All righty. So first of all, um, this is actually a picture of what we call the Blue Mountains. They're a gorgeous area um, in Australia, and they look blue because of the eucalyptus trees. And eucalyptus has like a blue tint to it. So you can check that out. I'm also going to show you some pictures of Fraser Island. Um, as I said, it is the vacation spot of that area, um, and it is a sand island, so it is constantly moving. Think about it. When the waves come in on this side, 
And then it comes down this way. It's basically just moving over and over. It's very slow, but it's always moving. It is known for beautiful beaches, and it's on a lot of calendars and posters. Um, in fact, um, if you ladies take your silver jewelry in there, you know how it gets tarnished? We actually washed our jewelry in there, and it took all the tarnish off your silver. It's crazy. It's just beautiful. Uh, they also have dingoes there. We'll be talking about dingoes a little bit. Now, they may look cute, like doggies or little coyotes, but they actually can be very vicious. So you don't want to go up and pet them. They can actually attack children and stuff like that. So um, we'll talk about one of those stories, actually. Yes, Mr. Jordan. Uh, so you can never build a house on that? No, not really, because it would constantly move, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. We, of course, have crocodiles, of course. Um, what is the name of a baby kangaroo? Joey. A Joey, and they're so cute, so cute. Now, um, how do kangaroo fight? With their feet. So remember, and think about how powerful they are, because they, they like force themselves up into the air. So what they do is they lean back on that big, strong tail, and they just go, yeah, like that with their feet. Um, now, I talked to this guy as we were feeding them, and he said, you know, they're not very, in fact, I mean, we're feeding them and petting them. They're nice to us. But um, there were two males fighting over a female kangaroo, and he watched as this, this one snapped the other's neck in one shot. I mean, that's how strong their legs are. So you definitely don't want to mess with their babies and stuff like that. You know, often they say that they're boxing because their little claws are up here, but it's really their legs that they fight with. They really stand on their tail. Yeah, they lean on their tail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, of course, you can't go to Australia without getting a hat, but I couldn't afford it because it was like 400 bucks minimum to get one of these cool Crocodile Dundee hats. So all I got was this postcard. But uh, they also have Uggs there, you know, those of you that have Uggs, 400 bucks minimum there too, so I didn't get those either because that would have cost me half of my money that I would spend. Um, this is the Gold Coast, and the Gold Coast is kind of like um, L.A. in the U.S. It's a very touristy place. Never seen anything like it. They have these meter maids, and they go around and put money in if your time expires, and they are wearing gold bikinis. So our men in the tour really appreciated that area. A lot. And they also sold, um, like, uh, bikini calendars of all of their little stuff. So it was so silly. I couldn't believe it. So silly. <laughs> Austria is totally Australia. different area. <laughs> Austria is in Europe. Australia is down below the Pacific there. Okay, here's the Blue Mountains. These are pictures of the Sydney Opera House, and there's also a picture of what it looks like inside. We went to a concert there. It's kind of the staple of, like, symbol of Australia. So you'll see some of those. And, of course, you got to love koalas, right? Uh, they sleep long, long time, almost all day and night, because they eat eucalyptus leaves that have a sedative in them, and it makes them really sleepy. And they are as soft and cuddly as they look. We went to the last place in Australia that allows you to hold a koala. I don't know how much longer they'll allow that. Most places just have you take a picture next to it, because they, but, and they really pay attention to the animal to see if they're tiring out or not, you know? But most people are saying you don't want to mess with them, so yeah. Make sure that they protect their animals and their wildlife. I believe it. Five hundred dollar fine if you hit a kangaroo or a kangaroo. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. Well, you know, when you go to a place like Europe, you go to see the buildings, the Eiffel Tower, the palace, whatever. But when you go to Australia, it's about the beauty of the country, and that's really what you see. You see rainforests and beaches and. And they have naked women on the street, yeah. Um, now, this book I showed you was half New Zealand, and then it goes into Australia. So in here, you'll see a little bit of, let me show you some things I want you to look at. Um, you're going to see Fraser Island, that island we were talking about, beautiful place. You'll see the rainforest a little bit, which is good. You'll see some kangaroos, um, some of the, the tree life. That kind of stuff. So I'll hand that one around. 
can see the beauty of the countryside. And this one is first half Australia and last half Hawaii. So in here, um, you're going to see some koalas. And um, you'll see the uh, beach line. You'll see the Aborigine guy that played the instrument for us. You'll see a little bit of the city life, some of the surfing, Sydney Opera House. Uh, you'll even see the Olympic place where they had the Olympics in Sydney. It's a huge place. Oh my gosh. So you can kind of look at those as we're going. All right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about Australia. And let's start with our Aborigine culture. If you look at this picture, you already notice that they are very different looking than our Maori culture in New Zealand, aren't they? And it's because they come from a different place way, way back. Plus, their living also changes their look as well. Um, you've probably seen them in movies and things playing a didgeridoo. You heard of that? And there's different sizes. This one here is a medium size. There are shorter ones, and they tend to be higher in pitch. And then there's also ones that actually roll on the ground that are even bigger than this, and they're like bass, like deeper sounds. Um, now, the truth is they are not actually named a didgeridoo. The British named them that because when they heard it, it sounded like didgeridoo, didgeridoo, didgeridoo. But really, um, like, for example, this word right here, in one tribe, that is the name of a didgeridoo. Yeah. Yeah. And in this tribe, this is the name of a didgeridoo. Yigi gruja, yigi dudum duck. Yeah, which also shows you that our cultures, the different tribes do not speak the same language. They're very different and quite often they don't understand each other. Just like our Cherokee wouldn't understand the Sioux, right? They have a different culture, okay? Now in order to play this, you basically take your lips and you blow through it like you would a trumpet or a trombone. Put your lips together and you go like this, you go. Okay, try it everybody all at once so you don't feel embarrassed. Ready? One, two, three, go. See, you're awesome. And we're going to give you a chance to try that in just a little bit. I'm going to show you the expert first. So you can kind of see how it works. And one of the things you'll notice is he never takes the instrument off of his lips. And that's because he uses circular breathing. So he breathes, breathes in through his nose, out through his mouth all the time. It's an amazing feat. Amazing. Um, they also are using this to imitate animals that they see in the desert. So as you watch him, you'll see... Uh, a snake, you'll see a kangaroo, a rabbit, a bird that is quite often heard in the desert. So um, check out this little clip. Okay, so Adam else has agreed that he's going to try this out. So the first thing I want you to do is just blow into it to make a noise so you know how it sounds. So you go with your lips. <laughs> okay, he is an oh, that's awesome, really, for your first time. Oh my gosh. Right. Okay, now try to do like high and low. <laughs> awesome. Okay, now I want you to try to do, let's see, see if you can do a bunny rabbit. Like boing, 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 boing. <laughs> Isn't he doing good? Hey, give him a hand. Awesome. That was nice. Anybody else want to try one? Yep, I watch it. Yep, come on up. That's really good. You did great, Adam. Most people can hardly get a sound out of this thing. A uh, real one. That, that one I carried on my lap. Okay, are you ready, buddy? Okay, so start by just blowing through it. Try to vibrate your lips. There you go. Okay, try to do a high and a low if you can. Okay. Okay, try to do, um, let's see, what should we do? A snake. Oing, 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 oing. Let's see if we can do that one. Can I just actually try to do it? Sure. You're doing good. You're doing good. It's coming. <laughs> it's not near as easy as it looks, is it? I was going up here like, <laughs> I know it. One more try. There you go. Good. Give him a hand. Good job. Good job. It was awesome. Thanks, Spencer. Now, at the on the mouthpiece, they actually use uh, beeswax to kind of build it up. I don't put a lot on here because I don't want it to get all germy and stuff like that. It's easier to clean it off like this. 
Um, so yeah, very nice job, guys. All right, well, let's continue on. Let's take a look at some Aborigine drawings. Now, we thought for years and years that this was just pretty art. And you'll notice they use pointillism. Artists, what is pointillism? Dots, right? Dots. But little did we know that this was not just art. It was a map. We always wondered how in the world they could get their way across the outback because no white person could do it. And it was because of this kind of thing. They were drawing either in the sand or on paper a map about how to get to one place to the other. So um, we'll kind of show you how that all works here on the next slide. You'll also notice that they tend to put animals that they would see in the desert. So here you'd see a kangaroo, kangaroo or maybe a wallaby. Wallabies are a little bit smaller, a little grayer. Uh, and here, what do you think this one is? A lizard, anteater, maybe a crocodile. They look pretty big, right? In fact, uh, let's see, where did I put that? Here it is. This is actually a piece of artwork that um, one of the Aborigine artists did for me. Can you tell what animal that is? A platypus with that flat duck bill. And you'll see the pointillism that he uses there. So I'll hand that around. This isn't one of those that you actually throw. It's just for art. So let's take a look. Means. So if I were getting, I would know that going through the center is not a good idea because this means that there's a site there, meaning there's a tribe that lives there at that time. So I would probably want to go either this direction or this direction so I can go here to here to get supplies and survive. Um, if you see uh, this, this is a watering hole. So like, for example, this is probably a watering hole, I'm guessing, based on what it looks like. So you want to make sure you hit there because you need water to survive. So that's kind of how they did it. You'll notice some other things like areas that had a lot of rain would usually get something like this. If there were just a few people living there, they might draw it like this. Animals, they would use this. So there's all kinds of different symbols that they were using there that we just didn't realize what was really going on. Kind of cool. Um, I think it just took communication, finally, that we started talking a little more instead of just ignoring each other. And you know what, guys? Like I told you, you know, in the New Zealand culture, Maori and white tend to mix pretty well. Um, but in this culture, it is like going back a thousand years. Um, every time the British would chase the Aborigine people, they would go back into the outback, and they couldn't survive in there. So they just finally said, fine, we're not going to chase you anymore. So today, I mean, there are a few that go to, the, go to town. Uh, I probably saw three Aborigine people the whole time I was there because the rest are living like they did a thousand years ago in the outback, just the way they were, you know, it's really interesting. And in fact, there are only two roads that cross the center of Australia. And when you get to just past the populated area on this East Coast side, you stop at like a, it's like a way station kind of, and they give you a walkie-talkie, and you can buy big things of gasoline and water. Because if you decide to drive across Australia, there are no gas stations. There's no cell phone service because there's no towers, and there's no water. So if you break down, you could seriously be there for weeks without seeing another car. Because typically Australians don't drive. They fly because they think you're crazy to drive across the outback. But tourists, we, of course, want to see it. So we tend to do that. So they give you a walkie-talkie in case you break down. I mean, it's very, very um, empty out there. It's kind of interesting. So. All right. Um, so the question is, you know, where did they come from? They came like 50,000 years ago. There are over a million natives today. Um, and there are two major groups. Most of them are Aboriginal in their background. But there are some Torres Strait Islanders. So they may look a little more like that Maori, Polynesian kind of culture. Um, this is why we see a little difference. We believe that these Aboriginal people arrived from Southeast Asia, which is why they may look a little more like a Vietnamese person as compared to a Hawaiian person, okay? And you'll also notice, obviously, they're living in the desert, which means your skin is darker because you're in the sun a lot. Uh, you'll also notice they're very thin, typically, except for the westernized guy that was playing the sticks in the video. He obviously has had a few burgers in his lifetime. Uh, he's definitely become more modern. But a lot of these guys are real skinny because, man, oh, man, they're sweating off everything they eat in the desert, and they walk a lot. So, I mean, it's kind of like a cross-country runner, 
tend to be nice and, and you know, because you run all the time. So. Did he color his hair? Really? Oh. That's really interesting. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Huh. I don't know, bud. Good question. Yeah. Well, um, these are definitely hunters. So they follow the food. They follow the water. They are not one to sit in the same area a long time. There are 300 clans today, and they... They use over 250 different languages. So uh, lots of different kinds of people all over the place. Okay, So who named Australia? There are actually two people that basically gave us the idea. First one was Ptolemy. Remember our Greek philosopher? Holy cow. Well, he believed that there was an island south of the Indian Ocean. He had never seen it, but he believed that there was. And so he called that land Terra Australis which means land of the south. That's the name Australia. Here he hadn't even seen it and he was naming it. Kind of cool. So let's take a look at who first explored Australia. The first to come over here were the Portuguese. 1603, Pedro de Quiros brought his group over by ship and they actually landed on an island called Vanuatu and they thought they had landed on mainland Australia, which it was not. Um, and they named it La Australia del Spiritu Santo, because their king was Austrian. So that's why they named it that. And then they found out that it was not the mainland of Australia. The second group that came over were our Dutchmen. 1606, William Jantz brought his people over to Darwin here on the northern side. And that was the first time they'd met the Aborigine people. The Dutch came back in 1642. Abel Tasman, that's the name, Tasmania came with his group, um, and they named it New Holland because they were Dutch people. Um, they also found Van Diemen's Land because his, uh, the governor of the Dutch Indies was named uh, Demons. This is also where the Tasmanian devil comes from. And yes, it is a real animal. I did not know that. Have you seen the cartoon one? And how he spins everywhere he goes, right? The truth is now I know why they use that. If you see a Tasmanian devil, he never stops moving. They pace like this all the time, all the time, moving, moving, moving. So that's why I think they probably use that. It's pretty cool. But it was the Englishmen who actually took and uh, kept Australia as their own. Uh, in 1688, William Dampier uh, came over here to Perth and met with some natives here. And then this is the big one. 1770, Captain James Cook claimed Australia for Britain. Now here's the deal. The story was, the king said yes. Whoops. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, there we go. The king said yes, you can actually claim this for our country as long as the natives get permission. But you can probably guess what happened. Yeah, he didn't even care to ask. He just did it. And that is why even today, we see the Union Jack and the flag, because it is still a British territory. Oops. Like I said, I think that may change after the Queen dies. I don't know, we'll have to see. So the first group of Englishmen settled in Sydney. Um, and remember we said they had a colony of 11 ships carrying 1,500 people from Great Britain. Half of them were convicts. The other half were there to keep them in line. And the convicts were basically given a choice. They could stay in prison in England or they could go to the New World. Well, obviously, they're going to go to Australia. So they did. Uh, by 1868, 160,000 convicts were living in Australia, which is why when uh, New Zealanders or Kiwis make fun of them, they call them convicts because that's their background, you know. Um, but I will tell you a couple of things. First of all, it was very dangerous for women. The ratio was 20 to 1 for ladies, so a lot of times ladies would get attacked or raped. Not a good situation. However, their punishments were very, very severe. Um, if you stole something, you were either flogged or you were killed because they weren't going to put up with criminals doing bad stuff. Now, do you know what flogging is? Okay. 
it's it's whipping, but this is what it looks like, okay? Um, it's a leather whip that has fingers on it of leather, and then on the ends, they tie something sharp. Everything from a um, sharp piece of rock to pieces of metal to glass to whatever they have available that's sharp. And so when they whip you, what happens is those fingers and those rocks dig into your skin and they pull out chunks of your back. So it is just horrible. Uh, we flogged Jesus Christ in history. We flogged in the Civil War. If someone ran in battle, they were usually flogged and then killed the second time. In the South, they just killed them. Um, yeah, and slavery, we did a lot of flogging. It's horrible stuff. That's why you'll see scars on the backs of slaves, because it's not like that's going to heal very quickly. So, And they landed right here in Sydney Harbor. So... Right by the coat hanger. So the question is, why did they come? Why go all the way to Australia? Three main reasons for your test right here. Number one, land. They wanted ranches. Number two, gold. There was a gold rush, just like in California. And also wool. They wanted a place where they could have sheep and sell wool. So um, if you look at this, um, like the gold rush happened down here by Sydney. Uh, over here, the soldiers and convicts kind of expanded up to Brisbane. Down in Melbourne here, we had a group of squatters that wanted to have ranches. So they kind of had land down there. We had a British trading company over here in Adelaide. And a group of English gentlemen settled over here in Perth. And so you'll find that um, Eastern Australians kind of make fun of Western Australians. They kind of have a stereotype that they're kind of snooty. And that's why, because they were gentlemen way back then. Yeah. In 1901, Australia officially becomes a nation and they write their constitution. So that's where it all kind of begins. So before we get into that, we are going to watch a little, oops, excuse me, a little video and it's called The Rabbit Proof Fence. And it's about, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes long. And it's going to show you the relationship between the British and the um, Aborigine people. So let me hand something out and then we'll explain it, okay? We are going to use a couple of imperialism. Does anybody remember what imperialism means? Well, kind of. Imperialism means that we're taking land. We're cutting. We're superior to people when we do that. Yes. Um, so, for example, when we took Hawaii, imperializing, right? And the British were the best at this. They said, the sun never sets on our territory. That's a test question, I know, on your semester test. Because they had so many territories throughout the world, the sun was always shining on something that they owned. They were very good at it. So um, we're going to look at how the British treated the Aborigine people. So if you will look at that's the first story we're going to hear about. OK, so if you'll see the column that says the rabbit proof fence, that's the version of the movie we're going to be watching. And if you're at home, I believe the whole movie is actually on YouTube. If you look up the rabbit proof fence, you should be able to watch it. Um, and as you watch it, we're going to just watch a portion of it. You're going to answer these questions about the story. Who are the people occupied? Well, obviously, these are the Aborigine people. So you can fill that in. The country that's controlling them, of course, is the British. The time period, you'll see at the very beginning of the movie, it'll be in like the first five seconds of the clip we're going to show you. So look for the year. It's on a document that he's writing on, and you'll see the year up in the top of the document. Okay. How were they taken? So how were the Aborigine children taken? Why were they taken? Examples of treatment. And you'll see there's a number four behind that. So you need four examples of how they treated the Aborigine children. Laws used in the story. And on the back side, it says, why did the country use this kind of treatment? Were they successful in reaching their goals and explain? And then also terms. 
okay? So I'm going to help you fill out some things for background first, and then we'll talk about um, what you're going to be watching. Okay, so if you turn to the back side where it says terms, there are actually just a couple of them. First of all, um, I want to tell you what the rabbit-proof fence is. The rabbit-proof fence was a fence that went from the top of Australia to the bottom, and it basically was to keep the rabbits out of the ranch farmland. Um, but it also was kind of symbolistic of white on this side, black and on this side too. So it's interesting that they use this fence in the story. Um, plus, these little girls in this story are going to be following the rabbit-proof fence to try to get home. I'll give you a little spoiler there. Um, so our terms, we're going to start here down on the bottom. We're going to start with half casts and creamies. Both of these terms have the same definition. These are two words that they used to describe a, a child who is half white and half native. So you write that down under your terms. The way this usually happened was um, a British man would come in and be an owner of a ranch and he would have Aborigine people work on his ranch. And quite often he would have relations or would rape the Aborigine woman and she would get pregnant. And then they would have a child that was half white, half Aborigine. Well, the British didn't feel that that was okay to just leave them like that. So they decided they wanted to do some things with them. And that's kind of the story that you'll see in the movie. The name of all of these children are called the Stolen Generation. These are all half-caste children who were stolen by the British in order to be civilized. And then if you turn to the front side under the area where it says laws used, we just have one for this particular story, and it is the Aborigine Act. And this act basically said that the British had the right to control all half-caste children. It basically made this one gentleman, I can't remember his title, it's a long title, but he became um, basically the parent of all those children so that he could decide who was taken, when they were taken, where they were taken, and things like that. So as you watch this at home, um, I will recommend that you start at the time where it says 5.35, and we end at about 31.54. Now you can obviously watch the whole thing for extra credit if you want, but we're just watching that portion for class so we can kind of see how they treated the Aborigine girls in the story and uh, what happens, okay? So we'll watch that now. 